I do dimly perceive that whilst everything around me is ever-changing, ever-dying, there is underlying all that change a living power that is changeless, that holds all together, that creates, dissolves and recreates. That informing power or spirit is God, and since nothing else that I see merely through the senses can or will persist, he alone is. And is this power benevolent or malevolent? I see it as purely benevolent, for I can see that in the midst of death, life persists. In the midst of untruth, truth persists. In the midst of darkness, light persists. Hence I gather that God is life, truth, light. He is love. He is the supreme good. I invite you to a journey across India following the footprints of Mahatma Gandhi. This journey will be an experience of the senses. It will give you an insight into the life and influence of the man who cultivated the ethics of non-violence and who himself, by being a living example, spread this concept beyond the borders of India. Is some of his teaching still in effect? And will it survive the jump of the Indian Republic into the 21st century? What meaning does Gandhi's teachings have for the future? The first place we visit on our journey is in the present-day state of Gujarat, where Gandhi was born and raised. Gujarat lies northwest from Mumbai, the former Bombay, on the Arabian coast of India. The approximately 40 million inhabitants of Gujarat live, as most Indians do, from agriculture. Rapidly developing industry has contributed to the fact that Gujarat is counted as one of the three economically strongest states of India. The largest area of cotton cultivation in India and the prominent textile industry are complemented by oil and gas fields as well as a booming mineral, cement and chemical industry. The name Gujarat is derived from Gurjar Ratta, the land of the Gurjars who came from the north approximately 2,000 years ago and settled in this area. The Gujaratis are distinguished in history by their courage against invaders and are reputed to be competent seamen and business people. They have a distinct tradition in music, dance and drama. Just under 90% of the Gujaratis are Hindu, approximately 10% are Muslim and there are also some Christians, Parsis and Jains living in Gujarat. In fact, the latter have one of their important places of worship there. You have seen the mountain Shatrunji near Palitana, on which there are over 900 Jain temples. The Jains are characterized by their distinct philosophy of non-violence, which left a deep impression on the young Gandhi, although he was Hindu, and which decisively influenced his later behavior. In the Indian tradition, Non-violence is called ahimsa, which means non-violence, or in a wider sense, all-embracing love. In the port city of Porbandar, also described as the White City, lies Gandhi's birthplace. The place where he was born is marked by a swastika, an ancient Indian symbol for prosperity and well-being. The house is managed by the Indian government and ranks as a religious memorial, second to no other place of worship. How did this come about? On the 2nd of October, 1869, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi was born to the trader caste of the Mood Banya. His family worshipped Vishnu who personifies the blessed and loving aspect of God in Hindu philosophy. The Gandhis played an important role in the political life of the then miniature state of Porbandar. Just like the grandfather, Gandhi's father was also Divan, a sort of prime minister of the state. 
grandfather and father were men of firm principles and had a great love for truth. They were renowned for their courage and for their hot temperament and their sensuality. His mother, Putlibai, was described by Mohandas as a saint of deep religiousness. She was a strong personality with much self-discipline. Her strict vows, as well as her regular fasts, left a deep impression on Gandhi. After the family moved to Rajkot in 1876, Mohandas, at the age of seven, attended primary school, which he completed at the age of twelve with average success. He developed a strong sense of pride during this time and attached great importance to developing his character. He was deeply impressed by the plays Harish Chandra and Shravana, which highlighted the unconditional search for truth and the devotion of a son to his blind parents. Shortly after, he changed to the Katyawad High School. At the age of 13, Gandhi was married to Kasturba Nakanji of Pur Bandar, who was the same age. The Katyawad High School is now named after its most renowned student, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi High School. On the ground floor, there is an exhibition where, amongst other things, Gandhi's report cards are exhibited, which prove that the later Mahatma was an average student and who, due to the marriage preparations, had to repeat a school year. In Rajkot, just like all over India, one finds statues of Gandhi, and there are streets and squares named after him and his wife Kasturba. In this way, he receives a kind of reverence which he himself would have surely refused. Gandhi wanted his fellow Indians to reassess and reform their own lives in the same way he himself did. What he wanted to inspire was that in the aspiration for truth, every person should recognize his own capabilities and use them for the well-being of society. As a Hindu, Gandhi saw God in everything and everyone around him and hence service to society is also the ideal service to God. Gandhi was described as a karma yogi, as someone who strives to become one with God by working for public well-being. When Gandhi was asked to give a message to the world, he answered, My life is my message. Even today, more than 2,000 institutions in India work according to his philosophy. And outside India, too, there are more than 30 institutions upholding his name and hundreds more devoting themselves to Gandhian social work. Rajkot today is an industrial city with a million inhabitants. As well as the schools Gandhi studied in, his parents' house is preserved and has been converted to a small museum in which a photo exhibition of Gandhi's childhood and youth as well as his relationship to Rajkot is documented with rare photographs. The Rashtriya Shala Ashram, inspired by Gandhi, even today contains workshops which correspond to the Sarvodaya concept developed by Gandhi. The well-being of everybody, which is a loose translation of Sarvodaya, should not be achieved, according to Gandhi, by industrial mass production, but through the production by the masses. As much automation as necessary, but at the same time, as little automation as possible, should result in the fact that every person in the country has work and autonomous village republics come into being, which are economically independent of the cities. After his schooling, Gandhi wanted to study medicine which was refused by his family due to religious reasons, since the dissection of flesh was forbidden by his caste. He then decided to study law in England. Although he took a vow to his mother not to touch meat, wine or women, 
he was expelled by the headman of the caste, since it was forbidden for members of his caste to travel over the black waters, as the Arabian Sea was then called. At first in London, Gandhi strove to live like an Englishman, which he had to give up soon due to financial reasons. After he started his studies, he invested instead in books, which he read eagerly. He even learned Latin in order to study Roman law. He lived modestly in a small room and cooked for himself. He became a member of the Vegetarian Society, where he met a lot of interesting people who made him aware of his own Indian roots. Consequently, he read the Bhagavad Gita for the first time, one of the holy Hindu scriptures, which was an enlightenment for him. Above all, the statement, abstention and renunciation reflect the highest form of religion, left a lasting and deep impression on him. For Gandhi, the Bhagavad Gita became the book par excellence for the recognition of truth, and was for him, all through his life, a source of optimism and hope. As secretary of the Vegetarian Society, Gandhi wrote articles about Indian customs and eating habits. In June 1891, at the age of 21 years, he successfully completed his studies of British law and received the degree Barrister of Law. The joy of his return to India was clouded when, upon his arrival at Mumbai, he learnt of the death of his beloved mother. Only after he took the ritual baths of atonement, necessary because of the expulsion from his caste, and paid the demanded fine, was he accepted back into the caste as a full member. His stay in India was a short one, because in 1893 Gandhi received an offer to represent an Indian businessman in South Africa in a lawsuit. Shortly after his arrival in Durban, Gandhi personally experienced racist humiliation in the form of insult and violence, which Indians, or coolies, as they were called by the colonial masters, were generally exposed to. In the lawsuit, Gandhi achieved a satisfactory settlement for both parties. During his farewell reception, he learnt that Indians in South Africa were to be subjected to further disadvantages, and he decided to stay and support his countrymen in their struggle. The struggle for national self-esteem and against racial discrimination began. To this end, Gandhi, along with his fellow supporters, founded the Natal Indian Congress. In the following months, an organizational structure was set up and Gandhi came into contact with public relations for the first time. He wrote his first political articles about the situation of the Indian in South Africa and gave speeches. As the first Indian lawyer in Natal, he had a lot of work. Simultaneously, he pursued his spiritual development. He read innumerable Hindu and other religious scriptures, as well as many works of Tolstoy. He deepened his medical knowledge, which he would soon bring into practice in various ways. During the Boer War in 1899, Gandhi formed an ambulance corps, which was active on the front for a month. At the birth of his fourth son, Gandhi assisted as midwife. The wish to devote his life to the service of his fellow human beings grew increasingly stronger and further changed his lifestyle. The teachings of non-possession, of renunciation and of equanimity as formulated in the Bhagavad Gita took hold of him. Henceforth, he always endeavored to implement these yoga teachings in his daily life. He renounced every worldly possession and gave all his earnings to society. 
to cleanse his body, he read about naturopathy. He refused medicines and fasted and experimented with different diets. Gandhi had great belief in earth and water treatments and discovered the therapeutic value of mud packs. Shortly after the turn of the century, he summarized his medical experiences in a volume, Guide to Health, which would become his most widely read book. The increasing public work necessitated a newspaper as a mouthpiece of the Indians in South Africa. Starting July 1903, the weekly Indian Opinion appeared in four languages. During a train journey, Gandhi read John Ruskin's book, Unto This Last, which captivated him. Immediately, he applied the ideas described in the book, and in 1904 founded the Phoenix Settlement, a community village with strict rules and a Spartan lifestyle. This community was, to a large extent, self-sufficient and reduced its material needs to a minimum. In 1906, as Gandhi once again formed an Indian Ambulance Corps during the Zulu Rebellion, his belief in the British Empire was shaken for the first time when he learnt that this campaign was predominantly a tax expedition by the British. To dedicate himself to the Indian situation without distractions, Gandhi took the Brahmacharya vow. He realized that abstinence in every way and the control of the senses make it easier to dedicate one's life to the service of humanity. A normal family life would demand too much energy in the interest of only a few people. In September 1906, the government of Transvaal passed a law according to which the fingerprints of every Indian man, woman and child above the age of eight had to be registered. During a mass meeting, Gandhi vowed that he would rather die than obey such a law. In the course of this struggle, the concept was born, which would become the epitome of Gandhi's life, Satyagraha, which means upholding truth. With this concept of active resistance, Gandhi distanced himself from passive resistance in the sense of weakness or helplessness. Later in the campaign, Gandhi his wife Kasturba and other fellow supporters were arrested, some under hard conditions. For Gandhi, Satyagraha, and in particular civil disobedience, was the moral equivalent to war and civil war. He was convinced that prison was the appropriate place for just people under an unjust government. In the same year, 1909, Gandhi wrote his book, Hind Swaraj, or Indian Home Rule. This work contains the essence of his criticism of society and civilization. He speaks out against materialism and the structured violence of modern Western society and warns Indians against emulating their example. In 1910, Gandhi founded another association in which various experiments in self-discipline, education, nutrition and other spiritual, moral and economic aspects were performed. He named it Tolstoy Farm. Situated at around 35 kilometers from Johannesburg, the farm was given to Gandhi and his people by the Jewish architect Dr. Hermann Kallenbach. Kallenbach also lived on the farm and became a close friend and co-worker during the last phase of Gandhi's stay in South Africa. After the government of Transvaal passed a law according to which the marriages of Hindus, Muslims and Parsis were invalid without a marriage registration, a practice unusual in India, 
massive campaigns of civil disobedience resulted in protest against the new law. Strikes paralyzed production in many places. Kasturba Gandhi was arrested as the leader of a Satyagrahi group and was sentenced to three months hard labor in prison. On the 6th of November 1913, Gandhi marched with more than 2,000 men, women and children from Natal to Transvaal to publicize the situation in Natal and to bring about the abolition of the new law as well as the three-pound poll tax. They were arrested for illegal immigration. After a long and tough trial, the civil rights movement of the Indians won. Gandhi and his supporters were released from prison. All their demands were met by the government. After over a 20-year stay, Gandhi, his family and some close co-workers returned to India in 1915 to continue their struggle against injustice there. They were received by a huge crowd since their activities in South Africa were followed in India with great interest and sympathy. Gandhi was greeted as Mahatma, which means Great Soul. This title remained with him throughout his life, even though he never laid claim to it. In fact, at best, he tolerated it. To begin with, he embarked on a year of political silence to journey across his country and to get to know it better. He founded the Satyagraha Ashram on the banks of the Sabarmati near Ahmedabad, which he moved to a nearby place two years later in 1917 due to an outbreak of the plague. It was here that Gandhi began to dedicate himself to the cause of the untouchables, whom he called Harijans, children of God. As he accepted a Harijan family into the ashram, many of Gandhi's friends and co-workers turned away from him. In fact, some of his own relatives, at least temporarily, left, together with other ashram members, as a protest against the revolutionary behavior of Gandhi in society. Today this facility, the Harijan Ashram, is operated as a memorial and educational institution by the Gandhi Memorial Trust, the largest Gandhi institution in India. The Gandhi Memorial Trust manages six Gandhi museums in India which provide information about the life and work of Gandhi and make their material available to the public for education or research. The director of the Harijan Ashram, Sri Amrut Bhai Modi, reports in his mother tongue, Gujarati. Sabarmati Ashram, Bharatma Gandhi ji ne karane jani to to thayo, kanke o ogniso pandar ma dachin Africa thi hi aave, kare ashram ma amne kaime nivas karyo, to aime ne karma bumi. The Sabarmati Ashram, as it was earlier known, specialized in the collection of Gandhi's correspondence. More than 34,000 letters to and from Gandhi from all over the world are in our archives and can be read. In addition, we have rare photographs and films of the Indian independence movement as well as an extensive library. In the new wing of the ashram, designed by the well-known Indian architect Charles Correa. Various exhibitions take place which document Gandhi's life and particularly the time he spent in Ahmedabad. Gandhi lived here for 15 years and conducted his first campaigns of non-violent resistance in India, which resulted, for instance, in the formation of trade unions. The original buildings of that time are in good condition. A sound and light show is presented every evening in front of the house in which Gandhi lived with his wife. On various occasions, especially on his memorial days, 
his birth anniversary on the 2nd October and his death anniversary on the 30th January. Functions are organized. Although the ashram lies only six kilometers away from the center of Ahmedabad, it was located beyond the city limits during Gandhi's time. Today, it is an integral part of Ahmedabad and is visited by hundreds of mainly Indian tourists. Even today, the ashram still fulfills its social responsibilities. On the average, more Harijans live in the complex and are employed in the ashram's own production unit. In addition to the development and production of manual looms, handmade recycled paper is also produced. These and also the oil and soap products are not only sold to small and large traders, but also exported. Visitors are happily and proudly shown these traditional factories where an ideal symbiosis exists and handicraft is complemented and made easier by the use of simple machines. It is inspiring to go around the ashram complex and with some luck one could still meet somebody who remembers about the yesteryears and could narrate some anecdotes about Gandhi. In the first campaign of non-violent resistance in India, Gandhi stood up against the suppression of farmers in the North Indian province of Bihar. Initially, he carried out an independent survey of the farmers' situation, who were driven to the edge of starvation by the British through the compulsory cultivation of indigo at low prices and high taxes. As Gandhi was ordered by the district officials to leave the district, he refused and expressed his determination to continue the survey in the interest of the public. He argued in court that his civil disobedience was not based on the lack of respect for the authority of the law, but his subservience to the higher law of conscience. Gandhi was acquitted and he continued the survey. The report of the Investigation Commission finally led to the abolition of the compulsory cultivation of indigo and to the reduction of taxes. In the following two campaigns of civil disobedience, it was possible for Gandhi to achieve an improvement in the situation of the textile workers and weavers in Ahmedabad as well as of the peasants in Kheda near Ahmedabad who, because of a drought, were not able to pay their taxes. As a result, Gandhi discovered the instrument of fasting, not to put the opponents under pressure, but for his own meditation and inner cleansing, as well as for solidarity with the starving workers. After the end of the First World War, the Indians hoped for the restoration of civil liberties, which were restricted in accordance with martial law. When, however, in 1919, martial law was extended through the Rowlett Act, a wave of indignation spread throughout the masses. For the first time, Gandhi called for a nationwide strike, for a day, which he wanted to be seen as a day spent in prayer and fasting, as well as self-purification. This general strike was a prelude to a further campaign of civil disobedience. Huge masses of people participated in these actions and committed themselves to abstain from violence against people and property. The whole economy came to a standstill and the country was in turmoil. Countless numbers of people were arrested and sentenced. a ban on public gatherings was imposed. As 2,000 people in the North Indian city of Amritsar gathered at a public meeting place for a protest demonstration, British troops pulled up and, without any warning, took aim at the people and began to shoot. The massacre claimed 400 victims and around three times as many wounded. 
as rioting of the people occurred ever more frequently, Gandhi realized his Himalayan blunder, as he called it. He had called upon his countrymen to rise up in civil disobedience too early, before they were mature enough, and hence he ended the countrywide Satyagraha campaign. In his weekly papers, Navajivan and Young India, Gandhi now concentrated on social awareness before he brought into being the non-cooperation movement in 1920. In a letter, he explained to the Viceroy that he can neither maintain his respect nor his loyalty for such a government which proceeds from one atrocity to the next to defend its immorality. Gandhi gave back his war decorations, which he had received for his medical service in South Africa, and encouraged his countrymen to boycott foreign clothing, all British goods, British schools and jobs and appointments in the British administration. He propagated the production of one's own clothing, and pledged, in August 1920, to always wear khadi a cloth of hand-spun and hand-woven cotton. Shortly thereafter, Gandhi reduced his clothing to just a loincloth of khadi, out of sympathy for the poor people of the country, and to demonstrate that he had taken up their cause by setting an example. To become independent of British cloth, spinning wheels were distributed in the whole country. At a demonstration in 1921, more than 150,000 pieces of foreign cloth were burned at a public burning in Mumbai. The spinning wheel was described by Gandhi as the Sacrament of India. The Indian National Congress incorporated it in the independence flag. It became a symbol for Swadeshi, economic independence which Gandhi and his co-fighters strove for, parallel to Swaraj, political independence. In Ahmedabad, Gandhi founded the university, Gujarat Vidyapit, in 1920, which was to help in preparing the youth for independence and to raise self-confidence among the people. Within the scope of the non-violent movement, Repeated clashes occurred, to which the British reacted with violent measures and arrests. In the small town of Chorichora, the police ill-treated the demonstrators of a protest rally, whereupon the furious masses killed 21 policemen. As a reaction to this orgy of violence, Gandhi ended the campaign for non-cooperation and went on a five-day atonement fast. He was subsequently arrested and sentenced to six years' imprisonment on the grounds that he was responsible for the uprising and for agitating the masses against the British government. In February 1924, however, Gandhi was released from prison due to poor health resulting from an appendix operation. Since his countrymen had proved themselves to be not yet mature enough for the non-violent resistance movement on a mass scale, Gandhi now dedicated himself to spreading the usage of the spinning wheel and the abolition of the concept of untouchability. Although the British Empire was Gandhi's principal opponent, he continuously strove to reform his own society and to abolish its injustices. Gandhi perceived untouchability as an inhuman sin and a flaw in the Indian society. In his commitment to the Harijans, he achieved their free access to Hindu temples and their participation in elections. Gandhi's struggle against violence, even in his own ranks, continued. In the Indian National Congress, in 1928, a group of young radicals, among them the later Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, demanded immediate independence from the British, 
if necessary, with violence. They drafted a model of self-government and a constitution for an independent India. Gandhi achieved a compromise with his suggestion that the British be given a year's time to agree to the demands and to release India step by step into independence. The British, however, had their own time schedule and did not accept these demands. Consequently, in January 1930, the Indian National Congress passed a resolution on independence, which resulted in the Salt March, the most famous campaign of civil disobedience of the Indian independence movement. Gandhi had, at this point of time, reached the zenith of his popularity and knew that the masses were behind him, when, in March 1930, he took the pledge not to return to his ashram in Ahmedabad before the achievement of complete freedom for India. The Sabarmati River flows with water only during the monsoons and a short time after that. Ahmedabad today is a city of two million with a prominent urban industry which results in the continual sinking of the water table level and water reserves are becoming scarce. The largest city of the state of Gujarat is bursting at the seams due to the rapidly increasing traffic. Noise and air pollution are almost intolerable. However, that was not always the case. During its history, the city alternated between prosperity and depression. Ahmedabad was founded in 1411 by the then ruler of Gujarat, Ahmed Shah. Around 1600, the city had the reputation of being India's most charming city. Just a hundred years later, the splendor faded and Ahmedabad declined. After this downturn, strong industrial forces helped the city back into an upswing. Despite its present troubles, Ahmedabad offers the visitor an abundance of attractions. In the city, several representative buildings portray the Islamic and Hindu architecture of India. In the historical city center of Ahmedabad, colorful houses, with artistically carved wooden facades stand in rows next to one another. Adjacent to the large number of temples and mosques stand numerous businesses and small factories mostly connected with the production and sale of textiles. For this reason, Ahmedabad was called the Manchester of the East at the beginning of this century. Ahmedabad also offers some interesting museums. For example, in the university founded by Gandhi, Gujarat Vidyapit, there is a very worthwhile permanent exhibition linked up with a research unit about the tribal population of Gujarat. The university is, like it always was, well frequented and has an excellent reputation even beyond the borders of Gujarat. Students from all over the country enroll themselves here for various studies in the arts, humanities and social sciences. The language of teaching is Gujarati and it is expected that the students, just like the professors, wear khadi clothing and daily spin a fixed amount of cotton. The fact that this goes hand in hand with a modern lifestyle and progress is proved by a visit to the computer center of the university, which is equipped with modern machines and where young Gandhians dressed in Kadi work. On these young people rests the hope for a new generation of Gandhian social workers. Just like there is a counter-movement towards the consumer society in the industrial countries of the Western world, here too, several people leave their well-paid professions and dedicate themselves to social work, or while working, involve themselves deeply in their society. The potential of this new generation of Gandhian social workers is not insignificant, 
since the social community in the Indian tradition is deeply rooted. There are justified hopes that in the coming years social action, as well as the ecology and human rights action groups, would become stronger in India, especially when the disadvantages of the consumer-oriented living would be experienced firsthand. Whether they can still put up an appreciable resistance to the destructive forces remains to be seen. The partly successful struggle against the gigantic Narmada Dam can be seen as a positive sign. Or also the work of Ahmedabad's Women's Trade Union, Seva, which stands for the Self-Employed Women's Association, a union of economically independent women. Pratibha Pandya, a co-worker, explains. Seva basically is a registered trade union and uh, its main objective is to organize the women towards economic empowerment and we believe that only through economical empowerment the total empowerment for the women in the unorganized sector can be achieved. And we have two main strategies of organizing and then development. And as a union we are doing four or five major things to organize the women, to create awareness among them, then to create community uh, leadership and uh, then to provide them with the legal aid for uh, implementation of existing laws and finally to get new government policies for the unorganized sector women because from our experiences we realize that whatever way we fight with the merchants or authorities uh, for the wage raise and other rights of the workers it is just useless if there is no protection of legislation in the meantime the work of seva which has been honored with several international awards has spread to other cities and the establishment of numerous similar activities has been inspired and encouraged by Seva. Even though the Indian society seems to ignore the teachings of Gandhi during the current economic upswing, there are many activities which are working according to Gandhi's philosophy. Towards building a national and social awareness, the Navjeevan Publishing House, founded by Gandhi, has made principal contributions by their reasonably priced publications of Gandhi's works in nearly all Indian regional languages. The seed for numerous social action groups was sown over half a century ago. Or was a grain of salt perhaps the catalyst? The Satyagraha Ashram in Ahmedabad was, in any case, in March 1930, the starting point for the 380 kilometer long march to Dandi, a small coastal town in South Gujarat. Till then, the British had exercised control over the production of salt, this very essential mineral, and levied heavy taxes on the sale of it. It was hence nearly a luxury, even though it was needed by everybody, especially the poor farmer. On the 12th of March, 1930, Gandhi, together with 79 soldiers of his non-violent army, began the Salt Satyagraha. His urgent objective was to break the Salt Law, which was so important to the Indian people, and to demand complete independence from the British Empire. During the march, Gandhi spoke at the halts in the villages, but, above all, he spoke about the importance of the reform of Indian society. Child marriages should be abolished, as well as the consumption of alcohol. He highlighted the meaning of the spinning wheel, spoke about village hygiene, the necessity to abolish untouchability, as well as to increase tolerance among religions. He summarized his demands in a constructive program the realization of which would have led to Sarvodhya, the well-being of everybody. Gandhi and his co-fighters covered around 15 kilometers daily. They reached Dandi on the 5th of April 1930 with worldwide publicity. The mood in the country had sharpened, particularly as the British gave no indication of dealing with Gandhi's demands. 
they allowed the situation to escalate. As Gandhi picked up a handful of salt after a morning bath in the Indian Ocean, and with that act broke the British salt monopoly, a fire was kindled countrywide. In all the coastal regions of India, salt was now peacefully but determinedly harvested, refined by the simplest methods, and sold. The women had a special role in this mass campaign of civil disobedience. During this decisive time, they left in large numbers the seclusion of their houses and threw themselves into the struggle. To that, Gandhi remarked, in this non-violent warfare, women's contribution should be much greater than men's. To call women the weaker sex is a libel. It is man's injustice to woman. If non-violence is the law of our being, the future is with woman. The people fought on resolutely. The police carried out mass arrests. 60,000 political prisoners filled the prisons, and even then the people remained peaceful this time, and were ready to continue the campaign. After Gandhi was also arrested, 2,500 satyagrahis tried to peacefully occupy the salt works of Dharasana. All over the non-violent protesters were knocked down, although not resisting, seriously injured and even killed. The government retaliated with more repression and brutal violence. Every new repressive measure offered, however, yet another opportunity to disobey it. The boycott of foreign clothing, the pickets in front of the alcohol shops, were strengthened. The farmers refused to pay taxes. The whole of India rebelled, and several provinces were put under martial law. India became a gigantic prison. The course of events gave the masses self-confidence and the power to persevere. When Gandhi was released from prison on the 26th of January 1931, the day of Indian independence, which he had proclaimed a year earlier, he said, I am hankering after peace, if it can be had with honour. After tough negotiations with the Indian Viceroy Lord Irwin, the so-called Gandhi-Irwin Pact was signed in March 1931. It left the demand for independence untouched. However, permission for the production and sale of salt was granted. Further to that, all the prisoners of the salt satyagraha were freed and the suspension of the activities of the civil disobedience movement was agreed upon to create the basis for further negotiations. Gandhi travelled to London in September 1931 with a team as the official representative of the Indian National Congress to attend the second round table conference. The primary objective of the conference was the withdrawal of the ban on export of Indian fabrics to England, as well as the return of confiscated land to the farmers. Furthermore, a modus vivendi for the communal problem was to be found, as well as the position of the princely states in the future constitution. The Indian population naturally also hoped that the independence of India would also be negotiated. During the crossing on the SS Rajputana, Gandhi slept on the sun deck, spun his daily quantity of yarn, and lectured on non-violence. In London, he lived in Kingsley Hall, which was the Quaker's centre for social work in the slums of East London. Many people gathered in front of the house to welcome Gandhi. I am thankful that I got this opportunity of being surrounded by the happy children and seeing the homes of the poor. Although Gandhi represented the Indian position very clearly at the Round Table Conference, 
the hoped-for assurances were not forthcoming. And with that, the conference ended, from the Indian point of view, without result. But Gandhi used his stay in England to gain sympathy amongst the population for the situation of his countrymen, which he achieved totally. As Gandhi was asked why he appeared at the reception of the British king in his usual Spartan clothing, he replied, His Majesty was wearing enough for us both. Charlie Chaplin was so impressed by his meeting with Gandhi that Gandhi's criticism of civilization became the starting point of the script of the film Modern Times. Gandhi was given a warm send-off from London. They were the result of the mission that brought me to London. I know that I shall carry with me the pleasantest memories of my stay in the midst of the poor people of East London. On the return journey, Gandhi also visited France, Switzerland and Italy. An audience with the Pope was refused due to his insufficient clothing. After his meeting with the Italian dictator Mussolini, Gandhi said, His face was like a butcher's. His eyes never stood still. The round table conference could not fulfill the hopes of the masses. Since a flare-up of resistance was to be expected, Gandhi was arrested on the 4th of January 1932 as a dangerous public enemy and imprisoned for an unspecified time in the Yerawada jail in Pune. The calculation of the British succeeded, largely because it was also Gandhi's concern to first of all restore calm to the population. When, however, the British, in a new draft of the Constitution for India, wanted to demonstrate their divide-and-rule policy once more in an impressive manner, it was almost a duty for Gandhi to intervene. The British wanted to segregate the Harijans from the higher caste Hindus and have them participate in separate elections. To Gandhi's disappointment, these proceedings were met with wide acclaim from his countrymen. To divert the British from their separatist efforts and to convince the higher caste Hindus of the necessity of social integration of the untouchables, Gandhi began a fast unto death on the 20th of September 1932 when an independent commission decided to strive towards common elections and an improvement in the social situation of the Harijans, Gandhi ended his fast after six days. After his release in November 1933, Gandhi led a several-month Harijan tour through the whole of India, on which he tried to convince his countrymen that India can become independent only when the curse of untouchability is lifted from it. With that, he achieved that many temples and wells were made accessible to the Harijans. Many of Gandhi's party members were meanwhile disappointed in his truthful and non-violent politics, since the desired independence seemed to be pushed further away. As a result, Gandhi withdrew from party politics and dedicated himself to Harijan work as well as village development. Having been without a fixed residence since the Salt March, Gandhi founded, at the end of 1934, a new ashram in the heart of India. He closed down the ashram in Ahmedabad and built the Satyagraha ashram with his co-workers and other inhabitants of the community in the Indian central provinces near Vardha. The ashram functioned mainly as a laboratory for the further development of village industry, to which Gandhi attached great importance. He was concerned that the locally available raw material, talent and tools were fully utilized. With regard to machines and foodstuffs, Gandhi said, 
from time immemorial, the rice is crushed in the Indian villages. Unpolished rice and hand-ground whole wheat flour are not only nutritious, but also create jobs in the rural area. He pleaded for mechanization where there were not enough hands to do the work. However, he felt mechanization was wrong if there were more hands available than necessary, as was the case in India then and now. Gandhi regarded suitable village schools as a basic prerequisite for a healthy village structure. Since the educational system made compulsory by the British completely ignored the needs of the village population, Gandhi developed an educational model which took into account the economic, political and cultural situation of India. Parallel to the economic independence of the schools, it was of importance to Gandhi that the intellect and the feelings of the children were as equally encouraged as their manual capabilities. The idea of Nai Talim, the new education, left a lasting impression on the educational system of India. The historical buildings where Gandhi's educational and training concept was developed and practiced are still being used today for pedagogical workshops and seminars. All buildings of the then control center of the independence movement have been maintained in good condition for the numerous visitors who come here daily. Some of the relatives and co-workers of Gandhi also live on the compound but an active ashram living has ceased to exist. Visitors can participate in inter-religious prayers and have their meals in the ashram canteen contrary to earlier times. This is no longer compulsory to the inhabitants at the ashram. What binds them together are the memories of the good old days which they happily talk about to the visitors. But there are other tones too. Gandhi's daughter-in-law, Nirmala, explains in Hindi. We get around a hundred thousand visitors yearly, amongst them many foreigners. It is important to be involved with Gandhi's teachings on a worldwide basis. The relevance of these teachings today is recognized by the fact that India, after the entry of multinational companies, has an unemployment rate of 32 percent. A decentralized village-oriented industry would provide more jobs in the villages. Gandhi's concept of Swadeshi is therefore not outdated. Reasonably priced products of the village industry as well as Gandhi literature is offered for sale in a shop. The whole complex was called Seva Gram by Gandhi, which literally means village of service. Why Gandhi chose Varda or, to be more precise, the village Segaonya Varda for his ashram is explained by the fact that the industrialist Jamnalal Bajaj, the then treasurer of the Indian National Congress, made land there available to Gandhi. Even today, the company supports Gandhian initiatives and people involved in the development of India according to Gandhi's concept. The Bajaj economic empire is a household name to every Indian traveller through the nearly exclusively Bajaj manufactured auto rickshaws. Bajaj has its headquarters in Varda, where even today the family still possess huge properties. The memorial site of the founder of the company, Jamnalal Bajaj, in the district of Gopuri, is framed by a row of stone tablets 
into which the complete Bhagavad Gita is chiseled. And these tablets are arranged in the form of a cow whose protection Jamnalal Bajaj had championed. Today Gandhi's ashram near Varda has the characteristics of a national memorial. In Varda and its neighborhood, there are, however, more than 200 social institutions, so that the whole region could be perceived as a Gandhian model village. Most of the institutions work in the field of village development with suitable technology and carry out work in health and hygiene. For instance, a rural research center is working in the research and the spread of natural and recycled materials for usage and construction of houses and in daily life. Although the work and the decade-long experience of this institution exclusively applies to the Indian environment, some of their developments have already been taken up by foreign environmental institutions. In the neighboring study center for nonviolence, young people can learn nonviolent living in theory and in practice, in this boarding school with a maximum of 30 male and female students, the ethics of nonviolence are imparted through lectures and practiced through daily coexistence. Not far from the school, there is a leprosy hospital which was founded here on Gandhi's initiative. The 350 patients are not only taken care of medically but they are also given the opportunity to learn a handicraft corresponding to their capabilities and receive professional training so that their integration into society is made easier. The biggest handicap for the leprosy patients in India is still the social isolation due to the fear of infection, totally invalid as we know today. Eight kilometers away from Varda, lies the ashram of Vinoba Bhave, a co-worker of Gandhi, whom he designated as his spiritual successor. The grounds of the community lie on the banks of the river Dham. The 35 women of all ages and social classes describe their institution as a laboratory for an ideal society. They live as far as possible self-sufficiently and make decisions according to the principle of consensus. This ashram is for many Indians and some foreigners the destination of a pilgrimage to the memorial of the late founder and the intellectual father of the ashram, Vinoba Bhave, who expired in 1982. He was famous for his long marches all through India in the 50s and 60s during which he appealed to the landowners to donate land to the poor. In 1959, he handed over the administration of his ashram to women who could concentrate there on their spiritual growth. Normally, in the Indian society, there is very little room for that due to the various family commitments and duties of women. The liveliness and the effectiveness of this institution is impressive and hence it is not surprising that it represents an inspiration for many seekers of truth from East and West and is an ideal for other communities. In 1939, at the outbreak of the Second World War, Gandhi chose Vinoba Bhavi as his ideal student to act as an individual satyagrahi against the participation of India in the war. Earlier to that, Gandhi sent a letter to Adolf Hitler in which he questioned the value of a victory in war and appealed to Hitler to end the war. The letter was unanswered. The Indian National Congress condemned the aggressions of the Nazis. It assigned Gandhi to work out a new resistance campaign he opted for individual civil disobedience. Since Gandhi wanted to keep out of the campaign, he nominated Vinoba Bhave as the first Satyagrahi, who would then publicly announce his non-cooperation with the British war effort. Bhave was arrested and sentenced to three months in prison. Other resistance fighters followed, 
and, in this way, the protest assumed vast proportions. As the British forbade the Indian press to report about the progress of the Satyagraha campaign, Gandhi retaliated with the closure of his newspapers and urged that every person should be his own newspaper with authentic news. When 200,000 resistance fighters were arrested, Gandhi called for the end of civil disobedience without withdrawing the permanent demand for self-government. The increasing tension in the country invited the danger of massive eruptions of violence. In 1942, the British War Cabinet sent a delegation to India to discuss independence after the war. The proposals were, however, rejected as not acceptable by all parties and groups. With that, the prospects for freedom appeared gloomy and pushed further away. In the course of war, the Japanese threatened an invasion, and the Quit India movement took shape in Gandhi's mind. The Working Committee of the Indian National Congress agreed at a meeting on the 7th of August 1942 in Mumbai with Gandhi's opinion that India's dependence on the British weakened its defense and announced that the British rule in India now finally had to end. In a long speech, Gandhi urged the British to leave India now in an orderly fashion and gave his non-violent freedom fighters the slogan, Do or Die. In spite of the press censorship, the slogan spread like wildfire and it resulted in revolts all over the country. The committees of the Indian National Congress were declared illegal and their members arrested. Gandhi, his wife Kasturba, his secretary Mahadev Desai, his English co-worker Madeleine Slade, who got the name Miraban from Gandhi, were also arrested and imprisoned in Pune without trial. During the nearly two-year-long custody, Mahadev Desai, as well as Kasturba, died. To the death of his life partner, Gandhi responded with the words, I cannot imagine life without Bar." The square on which the Quit India movement was proclaimed and was immediately followed by a confrontation with the police is named today after the historical event, Square of the August Revolution. Like all the big squares, it is an oasis in the busy 14 million metropolis. Keeping the present day appearance of Mumbai in mind, one can hardly imagine that this city just 350 years ago was a small fishing village along the coast of the Indian Ocean. The village Mumbai, whose name has been derived from the Hindu goddess Mumba Devi, belonged at that time to Gujarat, whose ruler in the year 1534 left it to the Portuguese. They, in turn, gave Mumbai to the British royal dynasty in 1661 as dowry and seven years later, the British leased the village to the East India Company for a small fee, since it had a protected natural port. Since then, Mumbai experienced an upswing in course of which the village developed into a city of superlatives. Today in the port, half of the Indian exports are handled and the economic metropolis creates 35% of the gross national product of the 10th biggest industrial country of the world. More millionaires live in Mumbai than in Germany and in some of the areas in the city the real estate prices are even higher than in Tokyo. Mumbai has the largest film industry in the world with more than 700 films per year it ranks far ahead of Hollywood. That is why this very Indian specific industry is described as Bollywood. It is true that the fast spreading television poses competition, 
But as a rule, these three R epics are still very popular in the cities as well as in the villages. The popularity of its stars by far surpasses that of their colleagues in Hollywood. Hence, some actors use their public goodwill during or after their film careers to involve themselves in politics. They have proved themselves to be equally good public representatives as their trained party members. The demand for social commitment in Mumbai is ever-present. Every day this colossal city grows by 2,000 inhabitants who leave their villages and small towns in the hope of a better income and a higher standard of living. Most of them live like one-third of the total population of Mumbai on the streets or in the slums. Very few of them find regular work and hence live off many small jobs. Actually, with that, they often earn more than what they did in the village. However, considering the high prices in Mumbai, the hoped-for higher standard of living can only remain a dream. Seemingly, the ones who live outside Mumbai and accept the long travel daily on the train, up to eight hours to and fro, are in a better position. Also due to this reason, Mumbai is described as a city that never sleeps. The famous railway station, Victoria Terminus, in short called VT, handles more than two million people and a thousand trains per day. It is modelled on the London station St. Pancras and is counted as one of the showpieces of British architecture of which one finds several examples in Mumbai. It was also the target of the bomb attacks in March 1993. But the catastrophes of the last few years, unrest, earthquake and bomb attacks have hardly left a trace on the fast-moving metropolis. Gandhi, at the beginning of the century, described the major Indian cities as boils of plague. In nearly a prophetic but also sarcastic manner, this title had gained some significance at the end of 1994 when the plague broke out in an area near Mumbai. Reinforced by the media, panic set in in the shortest time. Fortunately, the plague turned out to be less dangerous than initially thought. Mumbai, once more, went back to its daily grind, coping with its many small catastrophes and events. Politically, Economically and socially, the country is changing with breathtaking speed and nowhere can trends be so well set as in Mumbai. It is obvious that the country after the economic liberalization since the beginning of the 90s is regarded as a huge market for Western industry, which often collaborates with Indian firms. The consumer trend, which is strongly supported by the media, is noticeable everywhere. But it is also clear that a maximum 30% of the total population can participate in it, namely the upper class and the newly emerged middle class. For the majority of the population, the Western standard of living will remain an eternal dream and the daily struggle for survival will represent reality. This applies at least in the slums of the big cities where poor nutrition and inadequate hygienic conditions are part and parcel of daily life. It is also clear that environmental and health awareness is on the increase, if only with those who can afford it. Bio shops, which offer foodstuff from organic cultivation and environment-friendly products are cropping up in Mumbai just as fast as computer shops, boutiques and branches of McDonald's. Their hamburgers contain, however, no beef, so as not to offend the religious feelings of the predominantly Hindu population, and to win them over as customers. To the question, what the two of them think about the American fast food chain, they reply. Oh, well, it's a new development, a new establishment here. I'm doing pretty well, because we have uh, nice flavors for the people, like for the young crowd. Oh, no, they like all this fast food type, so they really enjoy. 
A number of Gandhian action groups have tried to resist the conquest of India by multinationals. Like a voice in the wilderness, they are, however, suffocated by the wave of modernization. The Gandhi Museum in the southern part of Mumbai, though, is always well frequented by Indians and also by foreign tourists. Here Gandhi's room can be seen in the same condition as it was at that time of his visits to Mumbai. Several exhibitions impressively document the important stations of Gandhi's life and the Indian independence movement in the small building. The extensive library is used by many readers. Films are shown here, and many drawing and other competitions for school students take place regularly. Several Gandhian institutions have their headquarters here and also carry out practical social work in the nearby areas. If Gandhi was looking for more seclusion, he would stay with a co-worker and sponsor who named her property in North Mumbai Gandhi Village after independence. After his release from prison in May 1944, he was drawn here. Suffering from mental and physical exhaustion, Gandhi recuperated with long walks on the beach and prayers in which thousands of people participated. The dropping of the atom bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August 1945 touched Gandhi most deeply and prompted him to say, there have been cataclysmic changes in the world. Do I still adhere to my faith in truth and non-violence? Has not the atom bomb exploded that faith? Not only has it not done so, but it has clearly demonstrated to me that the twins, truth and non-violence, constitute the mightiest force in the world. Against them, the atom bomb has no effect. The two opposing forces are wholly different in kind, the one moral and spiritual, the other physical and material. The one is infinitely superior to the other, which by its very nature has an end. The force of the spirit is ever progressive and endless. Its full expression makes it unconquerable in the world. The Second World War was over, and the British Empire crumbled. In March 1946, a British government delegation arrived in India to negotiate the conditions of the transfer of power. The proposals made by them found agreement with the Indian National Congress but not with the Muslim League, whose president, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, called for a day of direct action without determining the objective or the content of the action clearly. Consequently, in Calcutta, an orgy of violence resulted. More than 4,000 Hindus were killed and more than 15,000 injured. Due to revenge by the Hindus, the whole country was soon ablaze with unrest, which escalated into a situation similar to civil war with mass murder, arson, rape, pillage, and religious evils. Gandhi traveled to the worst hit areas, and through a fast he succeeded in getting Hindus and Muslims to lay down their weapons. During a march lasting several months, Gandhi endeavoured to bring about peace and reconciliation. He described his peace mission as the most difficult and complicated of his life. Without tiring, he was on the road, consoling and encouraging the despairing and admonishing those who caused this dreadful damage. He requested them to atone for their sins and urged them to rebuild the destruction and live together like a family. He reminded them of Buddha's teachings, who there in Bihar, 2,500 years ago, proclaimed the eternal law that violence 
can never be conquered by violence, but that hate must be overcome by love. To stop the genocide, Gandhi and the Muslim leader Jinnah made a joint statement, condemning the most recent acts of anarchy and violence which brought disgrace to the name of India and rejecting for all times the use of violence for political purposes. During a prayer meeting, Gandhi stressed the equality of all religions and remarked, I believe in the message of truth in the way it is propagated by all religious teachers of the world. He was successful in pacifying the mood in the country. The imminent partition of India into a Muslim Pakistan and a Hindu India worried him deeply, since he saw it as his life's work to lead India unitedly into independence. But the chasm between Hindus and Muslims was too wide, and even his close party friends finally agreed to the suggestion of the new British Viceroy, Lord Mountbatten, to divide the country. Gandhi described this decision as a spiritual tragedy. The midnight hour of the 14th of August, 1947 symbolized the rebirth of a country after a century-long sleep and a long liberation struggle. The independence announced by the first Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru, was enthusiastically celebrated throughout the country. Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny, and now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge not only or in full measure, but very substantially. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. Gandhi, however, spent this day praying and fasting in seclusion. He had all the reasons to mourn since the joy of independence would not last long. Soon, whole regions would be ravaged by unrest, and the minorities tyrannized and persecuted. Hindus left Muslim Pakistan, and Muslims left Hindu India. During this mass exodus, more than 12 million people changed their abodes. In the whole country, massacres occurred, resulting in the death of more than half a million people. As Gandhi's words were not sufficient any more to halt the violence between Hindus and Muslims, he decided in September 1947 in Calcutta, where the massacres were at their worst, to go on a fast for as long as the unrest continued. Gandhi was successful. After four days, peace returned to Calcutta, and some troublemakers, in fact, gave up their weapons to Gandhi. From Calcutta, Gandhi travelled to New Delhi. When there, too, clashes started again, Gandhi began a new fast on the 12th of January, 1948. He felt very alone, and his life's work seemed to be slipping through his fingers. As he said, Death would be a glorious release for me. I would have preferred death than to be a helpless witness to the destruction of India. He added, I pray incessantly that I will in no way feel any hatred towards my enemy. In fact, when I fall victim to the bullet of my assassin, my soul should breathe out its last with the name of God on my lips. After five days, Gandhi ended his last fast in Birla House in New Delhi. The clashes had stopped, 
and the governments of India and Pakistan had assured him increased protection of the minorities. Gandhi, weakened by the fasts, gathered new strength to be able to continue with his mission. After the daily evening prayer meetings in the garden of Birla House, Gandhi spoke to the hundreds present. On the 20th of January, 1948, during his speech, a bomb laid by one of the Hindu refugees exploded nearby, fortunately injuring no one. Gandhi remained calm and urged the public to continue listening to him. Even after that, he refused to have a bodyguard and prayed that the assassin would not be punished. However, Gandhi criticized the religious fanatics amongst the people as well as the politicians of the Congress party, which in the meantime had emerged from the Indian National Congress. The autocracy of the Congress party in the Indian Union did not offer to the non-violent anarchist Gandhi enough safety against the misuse of power and corruption. In a draft towards a change of party statutes, he therefore suggested that the party be dissolved and transformed into a loose union of peace workers. They should then stay away from party and power politics and, above all, dedicate themselves to the social, economic and moral aspects of constructive work in the villages. This political testament of Gandhi was, however, rejected by the members of the Congress party. The biggest democracy on earth after independence adopted the British Parliament's model. In an upper and lower house, the Indian states are represented by members of parliament proportional to the population. A fixed percentage is reserved for the untouchables. This can be traced back to the campaign of Gandhi against untouchability and, moreover, of Dr. Ambedkar's involvement in drafting the Indian constitution. Dr. Ambedkar was the representative of the untouchables. Since 1931, New Delhi is the capital and the political center of the Indian Union. After the decision made by King George V that New Delhi should replace Calcutta as the capital, the best British architects were busy adorning the city with colonial architecture. Its government buildings were regarded as the architectural jewels of the imperial crown. With its wide roads, Numerous parks and avenues, New Delhi stands out from all other Indian cities. However, the pollution due to the heavy traffic and an inconveniently placed out-of-city industry is worse than elsewhere. In contrast to the economic center, Mumbai, the administrative center, New Delhi, provides for a limited nightlife but offers prominent cultural options. Several renowned music and dance organizations are based in Delhi. The increasing economic growth of India is especially noticeable in the way shopping centers have mushroomed in individual parts of the city, relieving the traditional business center, Connaught Place, which lies in the heart of the city. Here, the offices of national and international firms, as well as exclusive jewelers and boutiques are located. In addition to the many street-level shops, there is a huge underground market which is built under nearly the whole of the vast Connaught Place. This modern architecture forms a huge contrast to Old Delhi which is only a stone's throw away. 
in the traditional markets located here and in the narrow shopping lanes, it seems as if time has stood still. It is easy for a visitor to imagine how it must have looked here in the early centuries. In Old Delhi, with its mainly Muslim population, the architecture of the pre-colonial epoch predominates. It bears witness to the changing history of a city in which, over the centuries, Turks, Mughals and the Persians ruled. The biggest mosque of India, Jama Masjid, stands opposite the Red Fort, where on the 15th of August 1947 the independence of India was declared. Nearby is a memorial to Gandhi. Here his body was publicly cremated on the 31st of January 1948. Every year millions of people from all over the world come on a pilgrimage to this beautifully designed memorial site. On the occasion of the 100th anniversary of Gandhi's birthday in the year 1969, the Indian government inaugurated a huge exhibition complex in the vicinity of the cremation ground. Here Gandhi's biography is documented in detail and his Satyagraha campaigns minutely reconstructed. The nearby National Gandhi Museum completes this exhibition by its extensive study and research offers. The library provides a near complete collection of all the books ever published on Gandhi, more than 10,000 volumes in all the languages of the globe. In the Gandhi Book House, located in the same grounds, customers have a wide choice of Gandhi literature. The Gandhi Book House is an undertaking of the Gandhi Peace Foundation, also located at Rajkhat in the northeast part of the city. This organization endeavors to apply the ethics of non-violence that Gandhi lived for to the current situation through activities in the political, cultural and educational fields. Parallel to the addition of their own publications, the Gandhi Peace Foundation sees it as their main task to encourage and cultivate contacts with those interested in Gandhi abroad. That is why, and also because of its guest house, it is an ideal contact address for Western tourists who would like to follow Gandhi's footprints in India. Regular lectures and seminars take place here too. The qualified employees work on different aspects of Gandhi's life and influence, always with the implementation to the present time in mind. The Gandhi Peace Foundation is one of the most active organizations of its kind, which also intervenes in day-to-day -day politics if necessary. In the wealthier area of South New Delhi stands the former house of the industrialist Kanshyam Das Birla which he made available to the Indian government as a national memorial after Gandhi's death. Hundreds of visitors come here daily to see the place where Gandhi spent the last days and weeks of his life. In spite of the bomb attack carried out by a fanatic Hindu on the 20th of January 1948, Gandhi continued to strive for an understanding between Hindus and Muslims. On the 25th of January, he urged that every Hindu, as a symbol of brotherhood, should bring along with him a Muslim to the next prayer meeting in Birla House. For the most radical group of Hindu fundamentalists, this was an additional reason to kill Gandhi. On Friday, the 30th of January, 1948, shortly after 1700 hours, Gandhi, supported by his companions, went into the garden of Birla House for a prayer meeting. Five hundred people were already waiting for him. Nathuram Godse killed him with three shots. Gandhi died with the name of God on his lips. The murderer was immediately arrested and months later sentenced to death in a sensational trial. With a troubled face, the Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, said, Friends and comrades, 
the light has gone out of our lives and there is darkness everywhere. And I do not quite know what to tell you and how to say it. Our beloved leader, Bapu as we called him, the father of the nation, is no more. Perhaps I am wrong to say that. Nevertheless, we will not see him again as we have seen him for these many years. We will not run to him for advice and seek solace from him. And that is a terrible blow, not to me only, but to millions and millions in this country. And it is a little difficult to soften the blow by any advice that I or anyone else can give you. The light has gone out, I said, and yet I was wrong, for the light that shone in this country was no ordinary light. The light that has illumined this country for these many years will illumine this country for many more years and a thousand years later that light will still be seen in this country and the world will see it and it will give solace to innumerable hearts for that light represented something more than the immediate present it represented the living truth and the eternal man would be with us with his eternal truths reminding us of the right path drawing us from error taking this ancient country to freedom. Gandhi's body was initially laid out in the rooms and later on the roof of Birla House. The next day, on the 31st of January, he was driven around Delhi for five hours past millions of people. On the banks of the Jamuna River, Gandhi's body was then burned, according to Hindu rites, on a funeral pyre of sandalwood. Still shocked by the assassination of Gandhi, the whole world took its leave of the prophet of non-violence. After 13 days of mourning, the urn with the remains of Gandhi was brought in a special train to Allahabad to the confluence of Ganges, Jamuna and Saraswati. Gandhi's ashes were strewn by his sons over the holy waters, which make beggar and king, sinner and saint equal. Mahatma Gandhi was, in a world full of evil, an apostle of tolerance, of non-violence and of belief. The strength of his intellect was the most powerful weapon of peace. The ethics of non-violence, of which he was a living example, live on without boundaries in time or in space. <laughs>